Good evening, good evening, good evening everyone. My name is Carlos Sillingworth. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for Coca-Cola here in Southern California. I'm also Chair of the Board of Directors for the San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership. We'd like to welcome all of you to our Coca-Cola Distribution Center here in the beautiful city of industry. We have many, many friends and many elected officials here tonight. We'd like to thank all of our elected officials for joining us. If we can give all of them a big round of applause. All of our elected officials, great turnout. Now, while we can't individually recognize all of our elected officials, I do want to acknowledge some. We have John Fasana, Duarte City Council Member, and this year's Board Chair of MTA. John, thank you for joining us this evening. We also have Mayor Mark Radecki and Councilmember Abraham Cruz from the City of Industry. Let's give them a round of applause. We also have our good friend, former State Assembly Member Mike Ng here with us tonight, big supporter of the partnership and of the COG. Mike, thank you for being with us. We'd also like to thank Assembly Members Ed Chow and Philip Chen for stopping by this evening. Ed, I see you in the audience. Thank you for being here. We'd also like to excuse Congresswoman Grace Napolitano, who would have liked to have joined us tonight, but she had an emergency come up today. Now, you may have noticed as you arrived this evening that you saw some of our trucks coming in and out of our facility. That's because we're actually open for business today. So don't worry, they know you're here, so they'll be, lo they'll be looking out for you and you should look out for the big red Coca-Cola trucks and uh, we'll all be safe and get home safe and sound tonight. Some of you also had a chance to take a tour of our facility tonight and you saw firsthand the types of jobs that Coca-Cola offers. You can work at a facility like this or one in Downey or LA that also has a manufacturing plant. You can work in operations and sales, serving our customers across Southern California. No matter what you do at Coca-Cola, there's a special sense of pride that comes from working for the world's largest beverage company and the most recognized brand in the world. Before I introduce you to a member of our leadership team, I would like to share with you a few fun facts about Coca-Cola, some of which you might know. We serve, for example, more than 4.9 million customer locations across the U.S., including some of the world's premier colleges and universities, sports and entertainment venues such as UCLA. Where are the Bruins at? We, we, are right. we also support USC. Where are the Trojans at? So it doesn't matter which team you root for, you can still have a Coke. We also serve the Dodgers, the Angels, Disneyland, Staples Center, and the Rose Bowl. Uh, we also serve uh, just about every grocery retailer you can think of, as well as small mom and pops, local restaurants. In fact, as I shared with our elected officials earlier, you may not know, but you should, that more than 30% of the revenue that our small businesses, the restaurants that carry our products, more than 30% of their revenue comes from beverage sales. So as you think about it, when you purchase a Coca-Cola product, you're not just supporting the Coca-Cola company and the 150 folks that work here, but you're supporting the restaurants, the local mom and pop markets, and all the folks that they employ locally, and all the cities that are represented by the elected officials here this evening. So uh, we consider that a very strong partnership and an important one here in the local economy. Um, we also continue to innovate and broaden our portfolio as a true total beverage company. We are keeping our customers at the heart of what we do. We are choosing to do more, uh, giving people more products they want. We removed, for example, full calorie beverages from schools. We became the first global beverage company to voluntarily commit to putting calorie counts on the front of our packages. And now we are partnering with America's other leading beverage companies for our biggest initiative, the Balanced Calories Initiative, aimed at reducing beverage average calories consumed by per, per person by 20% by 2025. All of this does not happen by itself. It starts with our leadership team, from our, our chairman and CEO, Mutar Kent, to the folks that lead Southern California, the largest market unit in the country. Okay, a few more introductions. Uh, I'd like to invite up. I'd like to invite up Paul Hubler, president of the San Gabriel Valley Public Affairs Network and co-sponsor of tonight's event to say a few words, Paul.
Thank you, Carlos. My name is Paul Hubler, and I'm the uh, Government Relations Director for the Alameda Corridor East Construction Authority, and currently serving as the President of the San Gabriel Valley Public Affairs Network, uh, which is a co-sponsor of, of this evening's event. The Public Affairs Network is a nonprofit group that brings together private, public, and nonprofit organizations in holding public affairs events of interest to the San Gabriel Valley. For more than a decade, we've been proud to have sponsored candidate and election forums, uh, as well as luncheons with our Valley's elected representatives. Our legislators represent, and in many cases embody, the truly extraordinary and rich diversity of the San Gabriel Valley. Despite this diversity, we believe they all share a common passion for protecting and enhancing the quality of life in the San Gabriel Valley. We're fortunate to have representatives, many of whom are here tonight, who are willing to put aside their differences and work together on behalf of our valley. And again, I just ask you all to please give them a round of applause. I think their commitment to reaching out to us is exemplified by the turnout at this event and the, the strong relationships that we have with our representatives, I think is really a, a model for the state and frankly for the rest of the nation. The San Gabriel Valley uh, Public Affairs Network is proud to join as a co-sponsor of this event. I'd like to introduce my fellow Public Affairs Network board members who are in attendance uh, at this event. First, my Secretary Treasurer from the Industry Manufacturers Council, Ben Wong. Ben, are you here? Raise your wave, he's back there. Then from uh, Metropolitan Water District, Luis Satina. Luis. Uh, from Learn for Life, uh, past president Bob Morales. From Kaiser Permanente, uh, Reina Del Haro. From the Chinese American Elected Officials Association, Albert Chang. Albert. From uh, Charter Spectrum, up here in the front, Peter Hidalgo. From the Moneris Group, Gabe, Gabe Moneris. From Waste Management, Terry Muse. Uh, from Foothill Transit, David Reno and Yoko Igawa. Uh, Citrus Valley Association of Realtors, Bill Rue. And from the Southern California Gas Company, Helen Romero Shaw. Thank you very much. All right, we will move right along. And uh, I'd like to now invite everybody to join me. We have a tradition at Coca-Cola. At every meeting, we all end our meeting with a celebratory toast. So for those of you that have your favorite Coca-Cola products, products or products in hand, if you could raise them. And we'd like to do a cheers and welcome you again to the Coca-Cola facility here in the city of industry. Welcome, cheers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, moderator for the evening. Please welcome Brad Pomerantz up. Brad Pomerantz really needs no introduction, but he is the longtime host of Charter Edition, a political talk show on the California Channel. On JLTV, he hosts the travel series Airland and Sea, and the news magazine, The J Report. We're delighted to have him with us tonight. Brad will be our moderator for this evening. Once again, this, welcome Brad Pomerantz. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I am Brad Pomerantz. Um, we're gonna have a lot of fun talking to some of our favorite elected officials. I wanna thank, of course, Brad Jensen for inviting me to join us today with the San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership. Peter Hidalgo, my colleague from Charter Spectrum is here. Peter, thank you for inviting me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Keep it really close, really, really close on the switch. Can you, ah, that's better, much better. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to have some fun here. We're gonna talk to some of our elected officials and we're gonna start with none other than the one, the only, the relentless State Senator Anthony Portentino. Anthony, come join us on stage.
Now, as Anthony is walking up, I want to let you all know, halfway through our program, we're going to have a lot of fun playing a game called go, True Confessions. So Anthony was elected to the California State Senate last November. He represents the cities of Glendale, Pasadena, Arcadia, Claremont, Glendora, among others. You know, he served in the State Assembly, as well as on the locking out of uh, Flint Ridge City Council. Each member that we speak to will get about five minutes to talk, and you know last year it uh, went a little awry. So let's start with the first question for California State Senator Anthony Porton. Today. Yes, Brad. Okay, the first question being... The first question. So, you have mixed it up with a proposal to change the start times for our public schools. It's known as SB 328. Why don't you tell us about your bill and what you hope to accomplish? So, SB 328 uses science and research on public health to set the school start time. Science and research? Exactly. In 2017, science and research? I know, as much as there's an effort to deny science, what we know from the research out there and from school districts that have moved their start, start time, that if you start school later, for teenagers, test scores go up, drug use goes down. Attendance goes up, car accidents go down. One high school saw a 68% decrease in sports injuries after they gave teenagers more sleep time in the morning. So my point is, if we know that school districts that have moved their start time back to no earlier than 8.30 have a concrete measurable benefit, we should do it. And so that's what the bill says. Following the recommendations from the Centers for the Disease Control, the Pediatrics Association, and the American Medical Association all say, for best health of teenagers, let them sleep in the morning. But what does the California Teachers Association say? Right now, the teachers and the administrators are both opposing the bill because they want to keep local control. The PTA, on the other hand, has sent me six uh, reasonable amendments they want me to take, and we're working closely with the PTA. And so tonight, which is why I'm running out of here, I'm hosting a forum where I have two of the researchers coming to Pasadena City College to actually share the research, and it's being co-hosted by the PTA and and myself. Okay. I was going to ask you about our former president. The President Obama Freeway is coming but to, the, to, the, to Eagle Rock. But we're going to stay on education because it's one of your priorities. And I wanted to ask you, what are you hoping to do when we think about our veterans and we consider their desire to attend community college? Well, obviously, Citrus College is in the house, right? Pasadena City College is in the house. Mount Sac, are you in the house? Rio Hondo, are you in the house? The San Gabriel Valley is a community college place. It is where kids go and thrive and move on to another educational opportunity. So what we're going to do is we're making sure that state law reflects federal law so our veterans have financial aid opportunities. So we're carrying a bill to do that. We're also doing a bill that says when a student gets 60 credits to graduate, they should get their diploma. Imagine that. We shouldn't wait for the kid to have to go down and ask for it. Once you earn a degree, you should get your degree and transfer and excel. And so we're doing some great things on community colleges. Okay, thank you, State Senator Anthony Portantino. Thank you, everybody. Heading to another fall. Thank you, Brad. It's always good to see you. You got it. I want to next invite to join us via the red carpet, of course. She is the supervisor of Los Angeles County for the <laughs> the fifth district. Her name is Catherine Barger. Okay, so Supervisor Catherine Barger, why don't we take a seat here? Just in case you're not aware, uh, the supervisor represents significant portions of the San Gabriel Valley, as well as portions of the San Fernando Valley and the Antelope Valley. You're losing your voice. I'm losing it. I'm losing my audience. I never lose my audience. Come on. You're going to give me a cut. No, it's all good. Okay, Supervisor Parker, a couple of quick questions before uh, we have some fun with you on True Confessions, because you are participating on True Confessions. I am. Uh, this isn't in the script, but I have to ask. There are five members of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. 
Guess how many are women? I know, four. Four out of five of the Los Angeles County Supervisors are women. Can I get a whoop whoop for that? Father of two daughters, got a mother, got a grandmother with seven sisters. I got lots of women in my life. I like saying four out of five women on the uh, uh, Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. How is that? It's great, you know, this is a nonpartisan seat, but um, obviously it's four Democrats, one Republican, and they ask, how is it to be the minority? And I say, four women and one man, you tell me who the minority is in this group. Um, we work incredibly well together, and I am so honored honored to be working with um, an incredible board. But honestly, Supervisor, does it feel different? I mean, you have worked for the Board of Supervisors for decades, if I can say. Is there a palpable difference because you are part of a majority of four women? Yeah, I, I really do believe that um, we attack things a little different um, than, than people realize. And it is about building a consensus and agreeing to disagree where we're not going to build that consensus, but working. And it, it you know, I would argue it is a different style of governing. Uh, in November, the voters of the city of Los Angeles were very generous, passing a measure to fund the construction of homeless uh, facilities. In March, the county of Los Angeles took a bold step, and despite all the odds, the voters of the county of Los Angeles were incredibly generous and passed Measure H, needing two-thirds, it got almost 70%. Talk to us about the strategy of the county now working with the city uh, to tackle a crisis that is facing this entire region? Well, I mean, for, for the county, we're, we're doing the supportive services. I know we have representatives from Covina here, from a lot of the cities. It's about working with our 88 cities um, because what's going to be right in the Antelope Valley is not going to be right in Covina as it relates to how you deal with the homeless. And so we're putting together a group, and the goal is to work with not only the cities, but also the businesses, with nonprofits. Um, I met with uh, um, individuals from Unity out there that are that are providing for the people that are poor, that are near being homeless. Um, and our job is not just to help the homeless, but also those that are on the brink of becoming homeless. And so I'm excited. Were you surprised that the county voted in such large numbers in support of H, including and especially in your areas, which some would argue you are the more conservative portions of our great region. No, because as I tell people, I, my friends called and said, how, how should we vote? And I said, vote your conscience. Because at the end of the day, um, what's happening is like a third world country, and I know we can do better, and this is a 10-year tax. This is not an ongoing tax. We have 10 years to make a difference, and working with our businesses and with um, our nonprofits and with, uh, with cities, we have to do this. How do you think this will improve our law enforcement efforts, looking at mental health as one of the bases for criminal uh, behavior? Well, it's vital. I mean, the whole program, the whole thought behind the program is that you pair a, a social worker, especially in mental health, with law enforcement. And actually, we're doing it in the, I keep pointing to Covina, but we do, in fact, have one embedded with the Covina Police Department sharing with Glendora and Azusa. And of the 10% call, 10% uh, of the calls that come in, only 1% end up going to jail. And that's important to note because our jails, I would argue, are the largest mental health hospitals in the country. So this is going to make a difference and it's going to allow law enforcement to do what they do and that is enforce the law and allow social workers to really get in there and identify um, th those that are in need of help. Supervisor Catherine Barger, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We love having you. She's coming back to play True Confessions. Don't leave, she's coming back. At this time, it is my supreme honor to welcome Ed Royce to join us on stage. As you know, United States Congressman Ed Royce is the chairman, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. We are so lucky in this region to have someone of Mr. Royce's stature representing us in the United States Congress. Very good to see you, Congressman. We really appreciate you joining us. If you could take a seat.
Of course, uh, Mr. Royce represents the communities of Diamond Bar, Walnut, uh, and the City of Industry in the San Gabriel Valley, as well as portions of Orange in San Bernardino counties. He's serving his 13th term in Congress. And Congressman Royce, I want to ask you about the new administration and the ambitious legislative agenda that they have for the new year and really focus on two elements, if we may. The new administration's desire for tax reform and... And, and I would hope infrastructure. And that's the next because question. Because for us in the San Gabriel Valley, for those of you in the San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership here, and there's 250, uh, 250 organizations and companies that are members, the reality is that we have got to work together, both in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., to make certain that we get the dollars necessary to build out the infrastructure, whether it's going to be the 5760, doing something about the confluence, expanding the freeway system out here, finishing the gold line, and what we have to do on the underpasses and overpasses. But on top of that, and that, that achievement, that achievement would get people home sooner to their families. It would help our environment by taking care of the congestion on the freeways. It would help us with our arterials if we can get these underpasses and overpasses done. But it would also create a lot of jobs in our region. And then, of course, the second, the second issue here is what we can do with water. Because this was a tough lesson in terms of this drought. We have, we have got to get more storage for Southern California. It's not just a matter of getting the money we, we pay for and contract for coming down, uh, pumped down here into Southern California. It's also what are we going to do for the storage and what are we going to do for groundwater re replenishment? We've got to get the money in to fund those programs. And we've got to work in a bipartisan way to do it. And then you asked about the tax reform. Sure. Let me ask you about infrastructure, because you mentioned bipartisanship. And this could be the one area where we see bona fide bipartisanship. I can envision a scenario where not all Republicans and not all Democrats support an infrastructure bill, but enough of them together will get behind our new president to push a package forward. Is that the formula you perceive will ultimately succeed? That's the formula that I think you'll see out of a lot of us in, in Southern California. A lot of Democrats and Republicans in Southern California understand this need for infrastructure and frankly for bipartisanship and we'll be working to get that done. And then let me ask you about water because uh, I, I, it, it's fair to say that even though we seem to be coming out of a drought, that's what our governor said, uh, the new president when he was running for office uh, expressed some skepticism about why we were in drought or whether we were in drought. Since you're a leader in Congress, have you been able to speak with the new president about the dramatic need that we have? I mean, we do have some dollars because of Prop 1, but that's a state issue. You're our friend in Congress on the federal side. Can we get the new administration to support us as we look to create above ground storage, groundwater replenishment or, or rehabilitation? We're pushing the administration very, very hard on this, and I think we can and get that support, yes, and we must. And when we look at tax reform, it's an issue that, you know, it's really hard to know how it cuts, if it's a Democratic uh, issue or a Republican issue. Some Democrats like some tax reform proposals, Republicans like others. Where do we see tax reform going in the wake of the challenges the Republicans face as a result of the Affordable Health Care Act? I think the wise way to do it is in a bipartisan way. I think we should reach across the aisle and and figure out between Republicans and Democrats how we can do something that brings down the effective corporate tax rate. I think that rate has to drop, ideally drop close to the average European tax rate. If we do that, frankly, the amount of money that's held uh, overseas uh, in retained earnings overseas that would be repatriated to the United States would be a major boost. So if you drop the corporate rate, you pay for it with closing tax loopholes, and you manage to maybe drop it from 35 to, let's say, uh, 27, 26 percent, which is about the rate in Europe. 
all of a sudden you would have coming into the coffers at that lower rate a trillion dollars over the next 10 years in new taxes new taxes as a result of those profits coming back to highest and best use and it would come back to the capital markets here in the United States so it's very more it's very much worthwhile to get a bipartisan consensus on this and I frankly think that between Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer in the Senate and those of us in the House that want to see this kind of approach we could see the corporate tax rate brought down which would be a great incentive for job uh, creation here but I think it would also do a tremendous amount of good in terms of having companies continue to locate in the United States we should combine that with incentives to make sure and disincentives to make sure that companies do not move offshore final question yes Thank you. Final question, though. In light of uh, some of the hangover in connection with the Affordable Care Act repeal, uh, new Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, do you believe that we can get to a place where we will see bipartisanship? The Senate, you know, they face some real challenges on the Gorsuch side. You all on the House side with health care. I think we have to, and I think if we start with infrastructure, it'll make it easier for the rest to follow. Okay. His name is Ed Royce, member of the United States Congress. Congress representing portions of the San Gabriel Valley, so thank you so much for joining us. Okay, it's my supreme honor to now bring up another member of the United States Congress. You know her well. She is Judy Chu. She represents the western cities of the San Gabriel Valley, as well as Glendora, Claremont, and Upland. She is serving in her fifth term in Congress. My good friend, Congresswoman Judy Chu, please join us. So good to see you, Congresswoman. So great to be here. Absolutely. Very briefly, before we get into the nitty gritty, you heard Congressman Royce talk about his desire for bipartisanship. Are you as bullish on the potential for bipartisanship as Mr. Royce? Well, I certainly would welcome bipartisanship. Uh, certainly, we would need it for an infrastructure uh, plan. And uh, what I would want is a clean infrastructure plan, meaning not attached to health care reform, not attached to tax reform. These are very, very complicated issues, but a clean infrastructure plan would benefit us so much, especially here in the San Gabriel Valley, where we are dealing with uh, the great separations, uh, uh, which are being uh, dealt with by the Alameda Quarter East Project so well, but uh, also the uh, the, the Alameda, the, the uh, Gold Line, and, and of course we must get it all the way out to Claremont McLaren to the Ontario Airport. Yes, indeed. Uh, Congresswoman, this year you were honored to uh, receive an appointment to the Ways and Means Committee. Yes. Which I know is a great benefit to both you and the entire San Gabriel Valley. That committee will work on issues like trade, tax policy, health care as well. Uh, talk to us about what you see will be coming out of Ways and Means. Give us a little insight. No one's listening. Tell us what really is going on <laughs> in Ways and Means. Yeah, this is just between just you and me. Between right? you and I, no one's listening. <laughs> Come on, no cameras rolling. <laughs> give us a little scoop of what happened with the affordable care. No, but, but do give us a sense. Look forward. You know, when we talk in six months, what, what can you what can we expect to see? Well, I did get this promotion to Ways and Means, and it was an incredible promotion because these are uh, one of the three exclusive committees of the House of Representatives, and all uh, revenue and taxation issues go through Ways and Means. So it basically uh, uh, it holds the purse strings in some ways uh, on tax policy. Uh, so taxes, trade, uh, Social Security, Medicare, uh, health, uh, human services, these are all within the purview of Ways and Means. So I was promoted to that position and the very day that I had my first meeting was an 18-hour hearing on health care reform. So it was uh, it was this uh, Trump care bill and uh, it went to four 30 a.m. Uh, so I believe me, I, I know a lot about this bill here, and uh, I do not believe that that uh, it's it's going to pass in the future. There's just too much uh, implosion going on here. I, I do want to ask you, and if you can be honest, I, I'd appreciate it. Were you? I mean, honestly though, were you surprised it didn't pass? Because I got to be honest with you, I just presumed it would pass. 
You know, the Republicans control the House. I just thought, of course it's going to pass. Were you surprised? I was surprised that Speaker Ryan pulled the bill on Friday. I actually thought that he might put the bill up for a vote and then hold the vote open and then twist arms. I see. But he was counting the votes and uh, he kept on trying to negotiate between two sectors of, of the Republicans. One was a moderate Republicans who felt that the bill went too far in terms of cutting Medicaid and then the Freedom Caucus um, Republicans who in essence, want to, to take more and more away from the Affordable Care Act, uh, almost repealing it in its entirety. On that Friday, he actually gave in to them and took away the essential benefits from the uh, Trump Care Plan. And that was just too much for the moderate Republicans. So uh, it didn't move the Freedom Caucus folks. They didn't give him any single extra vote, but it actually made the moderate Republicans drop out. That's interesting because the sense that we got just in the media was it was the Freedom Caucus that killed the bill, but your perception is it was more nuanced. It was a combination um, of the two, and if he went to the right to please the Freedom Caucus, he, he lost the moderates. If he went further moderate, then he lost the Freedom Caucus. One of the most beautiful things about the 27th Congressional District is its diversity. Uh, just a panoply of wonderful groups, and many of the residents of the 27th are foreign born. Um, I know that you've been holding events in your district as there are tremendous concerns about potential deportations mm -hmm. of some of your residents. Could you talk to us about what you are doing to be proactive in light of the dramatic policy changes we're seeing coming out of the new administration? Well, I've been deeply involved in these issues and uh, on the day that uh, President Trump announced the first Muslim travel ban. I went to, down to LAX myself. How was uh, that? Well, it was uh, an experience I'll never forget. I got calls from my constituents who said that there were 50 Iranians who were being detained, even though they had green cards. They had the right to be here. Some of them had green cards for 20 years. Uh, and so I went down there to see if I could free them. And um, what I was amazed by immediately were the number of people who were were protesting hundreds of people of all races, all religions, who were there to say that this was wrong. And so uh, that protest, I feel, uh, grew to such an extent, in fact it grew to thousands, and was all over the country in every airport, that uh, it did result in the stay by the judges on that Muslim travel ban. So you believe that that groundswell of opposition held some sway with our judicial I, I do feel that because there was such a strong outpouring of feeling by the people that they wanted this to remain the country that they know. But what we see, unfortunately, is still a very, very aggressive uh, action by the CBP, the Customs and Border Patrol, at the airports. And uh, what, from what we're hearing, uh, they are detaining and questioning all kinds of people not just those from the Muslim countries. They are detaining many more people and it's causing a chill uh, in all kinds of re arenas and that, that would actually really hurt the San Gabriel Valley. So what can you do, our final question, as a member of Congress currently in the minority party to express this view that these policies are hurting the San Gabriel Valley, California, and the nation, in your opinion? Well, first of all, we are expressing these views directly to to the administration, I actually asked for a meeting with Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, John Kelly, and uh, we had this dialogue. We may not have agreed on, on all the elements of policy, but I then did ask him to come out to Los Angeles to hear from the people themselves on how these are affecting the people right in the local communities. And in the meantime... Has he? Has he come out yet? He, no, he hasn't yet, but he did agree. Oh, good. He did agree, so we have that... Uh, and um, I really think he needs to hear from the people in terms of what's going on. But also, a number of people are holding Know Your Rights um, 
town halls and uh, it's important for people to know that they don't have to open up their doors to anybody, uh, any any police or, or ICE agent unless there is a warrant uh, and uh, they need to be able to protect themselves and uh, they had, do have the right to remain silent. Congresswoman Judy Chu, thank you so much for joining us. We know you're going to talk to more constituents later on, so we need to let you go. Thank you again for being here. Okay, my favorite part of the evening, I've always wanted to be a game show host, so I'm going to kind of get that opportunity. We're going to have a few folks come join us on stage. You know them well. Supervisor Catherine Barker, please join us again. Uh, Los Angeles County Community College District Trustee Mike Eng, please join us. And we're also going to invite, I think, Norma Torres. Is it Norma Torres? Yes, it is. Congresswoman Norma Torres. Come up to play True Confessions. This is going to be a lot of fun. Come on up here for True Confessions. If you haven't listened yet, now is your time to listen. Because let me explain how this game is going to go. Come on up. There's a lot of trepidation from these three because they're going to have some things revealed they probably did not expect would be revealed. Hi, Congresswoman. Thanks for joining us. Hello, Mr. Ang. Okay, so here's how True Confession goes. Before we started tonight's event, we had each of these three individuals write one truth and one falsehood and put it in an envelope. So one thing is true, one thing is false. We're going to be starting with Katherine Barger. So we have envelope one and envelope two. And we're going to have Norma Torres and Mike Eng pick envelope one, envelope two. We don't know which one is true, which one is false. And then Katherine Barger is going to read it. And the supervisor, obviously she knows what's true or false. <laughs> but the congressman and the trustee are going to ask questions of Supervisor Barger to see if they can figure out if it's a truth or a falsehood. We'll give them a few minutes to do that. But uh, Congresswoman and Mr. Trustee, would you like envelope one or envelope two? One. Okay, so they pick number one. Supervisor Barger, why don't you open that up and take the microphone, read it. Okay, this is good. This is going to be fun. So this is the statement. It's either it's true or false. We'll find out. My brother-in-law is Alice Cooper. Okay. My brother-in-law is Alice Cooper. That is the statement. Let's read the other statement. Can we read the other statement? Because I think that will add, add some fun. We're looking at my brother-in-law's Alice Cooper or, uh, or I once helped David Dreyer change a flat tire. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but we're gonna, but we want the congresswoman to ask some questions about to see if she can figure out is Alice Cooper Supervisor Catherine Barger's brother-in-law. <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm entertained. What is Alice Cooper's favorite food? Barbecue. 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 Am I asking about about this? Uh -huh. um, what is Alice Cooper's favorite uh, car? What kind of car does Alice Cooper drive? Aston Martin. Uh, Mini Cooper. He's <laughs> good. <laughs> One more question. About One more question. <laughs> Oh my goodness, you got me here. Okay. Where does, uh, uh, yeah, that's good. where does he live? Arizona. Does anyone know the truth? I don't know. <laughs> Am I asking about the Alice Cooper yeah. thing? Okay, um, how long is Alice Cooper's hair? <laughs> right about a little over the shoulder. Congresswoman, do you believe that Alice Cooper is Catherine Barger's brother-in-law. No, I don't. <laughs> Trustee, do you believe that Alice Cooper is Supervisor Barger's brother-in-law? Absolutely not. Supervisor Barger, is Alice Cooper your brother-in-law? Yes, he is. Oh! Brilliant! Brilliant! How? How? 
How what? How? Who's he married to? So um, Alice's wife, Cheryl, and my sister-in-law are sisters, and my brother, and so it's just the whole family. And he lives in Arizona. He plays golf, and he is a wonderful man. I love this game. That was terrific. That was terrific. Okay. Now we're going to go to Congresswoman Norma Torres. And she has a truth and she has a falsehood. So, uh, Mr. Ang, Ms. Uh, Ms. Barger, which one do you want? One or two? One. Read one. That was amazing. What about the flat tire? Yeah, it did that, that never happened. I couldn't change a flat tire if I had. Did you ever work for Congressman Dreyer? Nope. So I thought I, that could have been true. That could have been true. Yeah. Well, I thought she would stand it. <laughs> exactly. With a flashlight, right, right, you know? right. <laughs> Um, I attended Trump's first dinner with members of Congress, and they served bloody quail. Okay, so that's what we're figuring out. The other statement, I'm kind of playing the game wrong, but I just like to read it. The other statement is, my coat flew all around the world on Air Force Two. These are good. I like what you did, Congresswoman. Okay, so you heard that uh, she attended the first congressional dinner with the new president, and they served bloody quail. Supervisor Barger, why don't you ask the first question? Question. Isn't this fun? I love this. What room did they serve the dinner in? What room did they serve the dinner in? The White House was still being put together. Okay. So uh, we were close to the Oval Office. Close to the Oval Office. Uh, Mr. Hang. Um, why was former Vice President Dan Quayle bloody? <laughs> You see, if you don't know Mike Ang, this comes as a surprise to you, but it doesn't to me because I know him, and he is a very funny man. He is a very funny man. <laughs> because he bled all over my plate. Exactly. Okay, Supervisor Parker, another question for Congressman Torres. <laughs> With regard to trying to figure, oh, you, yeah, you, you, you're on. <laughs> you're on. <laughs> Did the president drink any wine? Okay, good question. Did the president drink any wine? White wine. wine. White wine, okay. Mr. Uh, are we, are we? Can we ask her about the coat or just? No. Just, no, okay. Mm -mm. Uh, this, uh, what, was, what was the statement again? The, the statement was that she was present at the first congressional dinner with the new president and they served bloody quail. Okay. Um, what, can you name all of the dignitaries that were there with you? Besides Dan Quayle. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> I cannot name every single one of the dignitaries, but it was primarily uh, Republican members of Congress. Name them. Speaker Ryan. How about that? Speaker Ryan. Okay. Anyone from the audience want to ask Congresswoman Torres a question about whether she was at the first dinner to try to figure out if she was? I like you. Yeah. Go. <laughs> What did the play settings look like, Congresswoman Nora Torres? Gold. Gold. Which makes sense. Uh, uh, the, pres the new president does like gold. We've seen his uh, palace at the Trump Tower. Okay. Shh. Uh, Bill Rue has a question. Yes. At the White House, they used the China from different administrations. Ah. What administration to China did they use? Did you hear that? At the White House, they used China from different administrations. Which administrations China did they use? Congresswoman. He flew it in from the Trump Tower in New York. Oh, so he went against protocol. Interesting. So, I think she did pretty well. I do. Okay, so Supervisor Barker, do you believe that this is a truth or a falsehood? Only because Trump doesn't drink, I say false. Oh. Uh, Mr. Ang, truth or false? Well, since Trump was criticizing China, I don't think he would bring China into the White House, so I think it's false. I mean, this guy. I, I, I just need to leave and let him, you know, just stand up all night. Congresswoman, is that a truth or false? It's all alternative facts. So uh, all alternative sure facts. So tell us about your coat that went around the world on Air Force Two. Yeah. A year ago, I was invited uh, to um, Central America um, with uh, Vice President Biden. Sure. Uh, we attended the inauguration of their uh, president, Jimmy Morales. Um, Senator Carper and I were the only From Delaware. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. So 
when we landed, I thought I was coming back with the vice president. But instead, um, Senator Carper invited me to travel with him to El Salvador. And I agreed. But I had left my coat on the plane, on Air Force Two. It's too hot in Central America, you know, to be wearing a, a, a coat from DC. Well, by the time we got it back, um, my coat had flown half around the globe, and we weren't sure if we could even get back my coat. Now, this coat is very special to me because my kids gave it to me for Christmas. Uh, my three sons put their money together and, and purchased it for me, so I, I was really desperate in getting it back. Uh, every other day, somebody from the administration would email my chief of staff and say, the coat is in this country. Uh, That's fantastic. We're trying to get it back. That's fantastic. Uh, How long did it take, Congresswoman? It took about three weeks to get it back. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. I got it back. One, we have one more round of true confessions. Mike Ang. Here we go. Uh, Supervisor Parker, Congress. <laughs> Torres, would you like number one or number two for Mike Ang? Number two. Number two. Okay. So, Mike, tr Mr. Trustee, read number two. Uh, you know it's going to be funny. If you have a white Toyota parked in the driveway... <laughs> oh, no. Stop! I was at the White House waiting to see President and Mrs. Obama, and it rained so hard, I dripped water on the President's shoes. Okay, so that's either a truth or a falsehood. The other possibility, which we are not going to ask about, is I was getting ready to be photographed with President Bill Clinton, but the Secret Service stopped just before I got to the front of the line. Okay, Supervisor and Congresswoman, why don't you ask some questions of the trustee? Um, regarding the White House? Okay. Whether he dripped water on President Obama, the audacity. Okay. Um, how long was it raining for? Um, since they didn't have a recycling plan, um, it was raining for 40 days and 40 nights. No, it, 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 rained, uh, it rained about maybe about four or five hours. And what happened was we were, uh, because of security and they thought I was a terrorist, they kept us about 20 yards away. And that's why we had no raincoat, no umbrella. You no, know, your raincoat was on the plane with Norma Torres. My raincoat was, was mating with your coat. <laughs> On Air world. Force Two. And they produce me. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, exactly. Judy, is Congressman, she would how like that. How do you too. follow this? Um, I know. How do you follow this act? I agree. What were the president's shoes? Were they loafers, tennis shoes? No, they were, um, they were formal shoes, which meant that they were so shiny that I could see myself in them, and I freaked out and ran away. I believe you. I believe you. Norma Torres. Who else was present? Good question. Uh, my wife, Judy Chu, was uh, standing next to me. And she gave you a big elbow. <laughs> and, and Supervisor uh, Barger, last question before we get a question from the audience. What was the president's response oh, when question. that happened? Um, I couldn't tell. He looked like he was stoned. It was the audacity of dope. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, he had, he just was very non -plused. Any question from the audience to figure out if this is true or false? Come on. You're, you're my go-to person. <laughs> What color were his shoes? Good question. What color were his shoes? Oh, they were black. They were black. Okay. So, Congressman Torres, Supervisor Barger, is this true or false? It's false. True. Oh, we have a split. Audience, what do you think? True or false? If you think it's true, clap. If you think it's true, clap. If you think it's false, clap. Hard to tell. Yes, absolutely true. Oh, yes. Absolutely true. My dream has come true. I got to be a game show host for about 15 minutes with politicians, which is like my next dream. I get to, you know, I'm a nerd. I can't help it. I want to thank the three of you for joining us. Congressman, you're going to stay on stage because okay. we're going to ask you some questions. Wasn't that fun, True Confessions? Brad, great, great idea. Brad Jensen thought of this. All of you know, this is our, our last guest of the evening, and her name is Congresswoman Norma Torres. Shh. 
Very important, we have a member of Congress here. <laughs> she represents the cities of Pomona, Ontario, Chena and Fontana. She served in the State Assembly, State Senate, and she was mayor of Pomona. A uh, few questions for the Congressman. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, you recently convened a major meeting of top transportation city officials within your district trying to determine how the federal government can assist the IE with transportation needs. What were some of the things you learned and how are you trying to provide assistance to your district? Shh. Transportation, important issue. Shh. Congresswoman Norma Torres, talk to us about transportation. Thank you uh, for that question. Transportation uh, absolutely is uh, incredibly important uh, for the district that I represent. You know, we are um, the front door of the Inland Empire and, you know, the last city um, in San Gabriel Valley. All the goods that come through the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach ultimately end up in my district, which is so key. Our highways, our bridges, um, our are so important to not just our economy, but also uh, to the commuters uh, that I represent. My constituents travel 40, 50, or 60 miles one way to work, it, whether it's Orange County or Los Angeles or further east. Uh, so transportation dollars and uh, transportation projects are very important and key to us. What I learned there is that, um, you know, I, I was challenging our locally elected officials as well as our uh, transportation um, uh, groups that we really need to blur our uh, city and county lines in order to ensure that we are maximizing um, state, local, and federal dollars. It's interesting um, you mentioned that when you think right. about the gold line and how we need that little extra spur to get into Montclair Bill route. <laughs> <laughs> and ultimately to the Ontario airport, you know, that is where we want to um, to ultimately end um, the, the goal line. But what I learned there is that many of, of our local communities are already working together and participating um, in that dialogue. So um, this week I had an opportunity to continue that conversation uh, with the Eastern Division of Caltrans, um, talking about the new uh, SB1 and how that will impact our district. I think um, Riverside, you know, congratulations to them. They got an extra half a billion dollars. Uh, I wish, you know, we had that to spend in the San Gabriel and Inland Empire, but we don't have that kind of money, extra money, but we will have a significant pot of dollars um, that we need to work together and ensure that we maximize everything possible. Uh, at the federal level, you know, we will be working on, uh, on a transportation bill. Uh, uh, but since then, we have been able to meet with Secretary Kelly. Um, what is most troubling to me is his refusal to acknowledge that there are some problems with his department, that targeting communities uh, of immigrants is not the right uh, way to address issues of immigration, that you cannot send ICE agents, for example, to a courthouse to, ad uh, to arrest, um, you know, whether it is a victim of a a crime or, or or a witness of a crime um, and I hope that our courts and our judges will ultimately hold them in contempt because it is unacceptable to think that we are bringing someone you know to justice and that the witness or that victim you know may be deported and not be able to have an opportunity well, you know to the, voice their concern. The chief of the California Supreme Court has spoken out against this practice. Absolutely. Congresswoman Norma Torres thank you so much for joining us. We thank appreciate it very, very much. I, love you. Thank you. I want to again thank uh, Brad Jensen from the San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership for inviting me to do this, as well as Peter Hidalgo from Charter Spectrum. This has been my treat. AT&T, Foothill Transit, Kaiser Permanente, Majestic Realty, Charter Spectrum, Industry Manufacturers Council, Southern California Gas Company, Citrus Valley Association of Realtors, San Gabriel Valley Public Affairs Network, San Gabriel Valley Newspaper Group, San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments. Let's give all those sponsors a big round of applause. And now our, our leadership sponsors, City of Industry, MetLife, San Gabriel Valley Corporate Campus, San Gabriel Basin, 
Water Quality Authority, Sanitation Districts of LA County, Three Valleys Municipal Water District, and the Upper San Gabriel Valley Municipal Water District. One big round of applause for all our leadership sponsors.